Now with the crutch done, the next step on this is going to be to try to get some more data for our mufflers. We got our mufflers back from Scott Dinger today. We got some back from Bob Zambelli. We want to do some, in the near future, do some testing. And we were real fortunate that this plane was very easy to change the motor and muffler and we learned a lot, but we still have a lot more to learn before we make a final decision and get a muffler that we're going to settle in on for the new ship. It was certainly an adventure making that crutch, but I think we got the basis, the good, a good start for the new ship. I feel real confident about that. And the next step on this is going to be our muffler work. Scott Dinger, who did another fabulous job for us. He, of course, is in a muffler business. His website, and let me just leave this on a screen for a second so you can put it on stop screen. His phone number, 805-526-9074. He's out in California, and he did an exceptional job of welding up these test parts. I want to thank him a whole lot. Now we know, as ugly as this muffler is, and this really isn't the showstopper, we had our little fake welding that we would do and fail at the back, but just by solder in the back. And the soldering joints we did back here worked, and it really allowed us the luxury of getting a rough idea of of what was going to be possible. We also had Brian's muffler. Brian's worked fine. Actually worked real well. Was a little bit heavier than what we wanted. I haven't run this one yet. This one we're going to run tomorrow or the next day we set up. We've got a spare header to use. We ran this little mini pipe that I had put on the uh, Typhoon. We were able to with some confidence now remove that part off the engine and just by making a little modification, we can get the header closer up on a muffler. Bob Zambelli took three of these and thinned out the flanges. What we're going to try to do with these in the course of the test is see if we can use a 76 header instead of a 90 header, which get a look at the difference. It's, it's a lot, a lot more weight. This is the original piece that we had sawed off right at the field because it was too restrictive. Worked fine for Rich Oliver, running it at lower RPM. And Sergi Belko's muffler, which runs great on a 60 as delivered. Bob Zambelli has opened that up. And if you look inside, I don't know if you can see inside how he, he has this adjustable now. But we'll be able to test that. We also have four of them that Scott, I had made them up and Scott had welded. I gave him each one in a separate bag so he could... Uh, get them together. Now we can take them out, clean them up a little bit, and what's going to happen, the next day we get, and I don't know when that's going to be, we're going to, we're going to dedicate a whole day to testing mufflers and gathering data. Now let me just do a little storyboard about some of the information we want to gather. And this is, this would apply to any engine, by the way. Now these are the ones Scott welded up. And again, keep in mind, we're making what I think is a very serious attempt at maximizing the exhaust system. Now we have a couple of goals. We like to keep the exhaust system under two ounces. That would be goal one. As of right now, I know we don't need these headers, these flanges, and, and Bob Zambelli can mill those down if we find any of these that really work well. And you notice they're all a different length because I wanted to see that at 8400, if I was going to be able to get any kind of a tuning spike, Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Sometimes just by moving at an inch or so, you can create a tuning spike that works in your favor, or you can create a negative tuning spike. And that's why we have the three headers that have already been milled. And again, this little guy, which we haven't even had on a plane yet, that the part of this test is to see if it's going to melt. Now, as you get the muffler closer and closer to the engine, there's a point at which this becomes unreliable because the temperature gets hotter and hotter the closer you get into that exhaust and we have a digital thermometer a laser thermometer we're going to be doing a lot of that testing that's why I'm going to dedicate a whole day now you might be thinking well this is a pretty pretty intense thing it is because you have people that 
well, they're selling exhaust systems, making exhaust systems, whatever, and they've never done any testing. They just, you know, I don't, I don't even know how they do it. I don't even care. But, but this is a serious attempt at, we know the RPM range we want, and we've spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars on these parts already, and we know we have a great crutch, and we know the nicest thing is we have what I call a square one. And this is going to be the basis, the square one for everything we do, is the, the system that we've had in the plane for basically, uh, we're on the third case of fuel, about in the middle, that's 10 or 11 gallons of fuel. So we do have a good database, but we're going to try to push it a little further in the next day or so. Now when you set out to have a basic understanding of exhaust systems, it starts out looking real easy. You bolt a tongue muffler or a tube muffler to a plane and you're ready to go. But this, the person who designed it or to, who put a lot of thought and energy into it had to take into, a lot, into account a lot of considerations. The biggest one is the volume and usually but not always more is better. Virtually all rules that govern exhaust systems are almost always, but not always. Weight, well sure, if, we, if you had a, a, a car, you wouldn't care what, or a helicopter, they can run five and six ounce exhaust systems. We want less is better. Restriction, now this is where it gets tricky. You would think we want unrestricted exhaust. Well, you don't. When an exhaust is unrestricted, the motor runs too cool to give you a proper stunt run. When it's too restrictive, it can run too hot. Now, as an example, here's our example of this made the motor, as we upped the RPM, the motor ran too hot. Ran fine at lower RPMs, too restrictive for 8400. So understanding some of these things, one of the things that happens with any tuning, exhaust tuning is funny. People think the only tuning wave you have is in the exhaust pipe, and that's not true. There's an intake tuning, there's resonant tuning inside the case itself, there's resonant tuning inside any exhaust system. Even in a tongue muffler, you can have power spikes. And these can come and go randomly because you never know. There's almost no physical way to calculate out where you're going to get a spike until you actually test it or do the testing. And that's why we made an example of why we do the test. We made one a little bit shorter, one a little bit longer, that basically everything else is the same, to see if there was a gain or not a gain. Now if I put one of these on, and typically the smaller I make the volume, it's just going to restrict it more and more up to a point. But if all of a sudden I restrict it in and I get a spike, I know I'm getting a tuning spike from this smaller size. So again, more data, more information we need to digest. The cost, well, if cost were not an object, if you work for Boeing, you know, you can just have the thing made out of titanium or solid gold or something. In our, in our case, we'd like to use as many standard parts as possible and have them as inexpensive as possible. We'd also like to have it that we can make the parts and sell them to other people if possible, but we don't want to just sell a bunch of junk. I just don't want to sell stuff that's going to melt or fry or bend or crack. Or If it's on my test plane, I don't care. But, but this I have to keep, well, I have to keep it to a reasonable amount. The other thing that's real important is the, the appearance. Now, some people don't like the appearance of a big tune pipe hanging out of the plane at, a, at an angle where it looks like it's laying an egg. A lot of people resist building a plane for a pipe because they don't want to gut out the whole inside or modify a plane they already have. But one of the advantages we have is all of this exhaust system is going to be inside the plane, hopefully. And we're going to have, I hope, at the end, a very nice appearance. And the fit. We'd like it to fit. And I'd like it to fit exactly how I want it. I want to have a very neat appearing professional looking exhaust system when I'm done with this project. Now we've had every kind of experimental thing hanging off, drooling off, off the, out of the wingtips and and we've gathered data but now we have to process the data. But these are just some of the considerations that have to go into any exhaust system. It isn't just a question of bingo and you're done. Now here's one of the real real world 
things that I experienced. 1988. It was my first year of shooting the Nats videos. I went out, shot the videos, and by the way, this is one of the one sets I don't have any real copies of anymore. 1988 in Virginia. Well, Brian Ether came out. Pretty much everybody was running Tiger 60s back then. And Brian Ether came out with this. I'm just going to make a sloppy drawing. He had a bunch of holes drilled in a tongue muffler, and they were threaded for 632 bolts. And so what he could do is just thread in a bolt, thread in a bolt, thread in a bolt, and he arrived at the, the exhaust restriction that four of these holes, four 632 holes, they gave him the most pleasant, beautiful run in Tiger 60. Billy Simons and I were going crazy just looking at it and drooling. We were loving every minute of it. There was only one problem with it. And, and it was, we hadn't taken into account one of the most important features. This worked for Brian very well because he was running a 7-inch pitch prop at very low RPM. We had never taken that into account. At that time, I thought a motor is a motor is a schmoda. You run it hard, you run it slow, you run it this way, that way, it never changes. Wrong. This... If you, if, and I'm just going to make a number up. I'm going to pretend Brian was running this at 8,000. If you start running this motor at 9,000, this is going to restrict it. You're going to have heat issues. And at certainly at 10,000, you could hurt the motor. So what Brian had developed at the time was a very nice tongue muffler that worked in conjunction with a 7-pitch prop. And this is why we need to know what RPM we want to run this motor at. Now, if we were going to run this motor at 10 grand with a pipe, everything changes. But we want to develop this to run with a relatively pleasant sound, and, and not always the quietest sound. A decibel meter is a funny thing. Some sounds are annoying, some are not that annoying. There's a weed whacker sound, it will wake you up, make you jump out of bed. A, a, the garbage truck goes by, or a diesel train, it's not offensive at all, and yet it's a higher number on a decibel scale. When the pitch goes up, it gets annoying. So what we're going to do is we're going to settle on this RPM of, well, right now it's 8,400 to do all our testing. We want to do all our testing at 8,400. But again, I always want to be aware of that when, when you lower the RPM, you can restrict the exhaust to a certain degree. And that's how Rich Oliver got away. When Rich and Al were running this, they, it ran fine at lower RPM. As soon as I put the wood to the metal, put the pedal to the metal, was too restrictive. One of the people that added to my my knowledge of exhaust systems, a person named Kenny. Why don't you remember this name? Augustine. Go to any place where they race motorcycles and they'll know who Kenny Augustine is. One of the top tuners in the world. Former employee of a speed shop here. He eventually opened his own speed shop. He was my tenant for many years. During the time of his tenancy, he prepped all of my race motorcycles and explained things to me. That one of the things you would love to do, and this is something to always keep in account. He's a model plane guy, by the way, and he loves K&B engines. He used to collect K&B engines. If you didn't have the restriction of size, the exhaust system that we all would want to have, I'm going to make this up as if it's funny, but it isn't funny, is a blimp. And when he explained this to me, he says the best exhaust system in the world is the Goodyear blimp. You run the whole race, and then exhaust, when you're all done, you open up the petcock and let out the sound. Yes. And anytime you want to hear that, the effect of that, just go get a, a giant soda bottle, poke a couple cans, some holes in the end, and put it on the end of a header. And you'll see, even a soda bottle is a good muffler. The only problem is, and there's a problem with it, is you have to be able to put this in the plane. So that's one of our restrictions. We'd like, to, we'd like the volume to be as big as possible, but still reasonable to get up in the, in the front of the plane. Now, I don't know how reasonable this is going to be, because this is kind of wide. It may stick out the bottom, stick out the side. But I wanted to make a prototype up. Sergi Belko's muffler is really a work of art. It's all camera threaded together. But again, I don't know that everybody would want to have the exhaust coming out right in front of the wing. 
but but we found that this ran really great on a 61 ran great on a 65 76 got real restrictive 90 choking but again that's how we that's how we learn these things and that's how we're going to do our testing that is another issue that comes into this. I have a database that I work from. I've collected notes for 30 years. This is my database. It's my proprietary information that I use to run the business. How do you do certain things that are proprietary? Well, an exhaust system is one of the proprietary things and I'm sharing as much of it as I think is reasonable here that it wouldn't get too, too overwhelming or too awful to know but always feel free if you're gonna do some experiment and I'm glad to help but the database is something that would take up hundreds of videos but one of the things it's good to gather data and you wanna in, in this case tomorrow or the next day we're gonna gather data and I'm just gonna make up an example because this is where it really gets difficult this is where it it turns into a Kenny Augustine thing instead of somebody with less experience let me just make this real easy so you go out to the test bench and you record data and you write that in the book you record this data you record this data but now you have to know how to marry up to get the best result and that's the part that's difficult so we may run into a situation where this muffle is the lightest but this one runs the best this one runs even better but melts. This one sticks out of the plane at the wrong spot. This one's the lightest, but the header broke because we made it too thin. The pipe one is great, but it has a sound we don't like. We don't like that high RPM sound. Brian's muffler, hey, he made this out of a lawn chair. We, we got a couple gallons of fuel through this. No problem at all. But I wouldn't want this in my new be-all, end-all plane. I'd like to have something a little more polished looking, a little nicer looking. And now what we'll do with these with these mufflers, any of them that work, and what I, I even made one with one, th these are all 425 holes. I made one, and this is out of a 76 header, because what I wanted to do, I want to adapt some of these headers. Now the 76 headers do not fit, this is the 91 exhaust port. So we have to do a little grinding and a little dremeling. In fact, we're going to have to do a lot of dremeling here, about half of the screw hole to get these to fit, but I think ultimately they will fit. Ultimately we can make these fit. And the other thing too I want to find out, when we get one that we really like, or if, and we're going to number each one eventually, when we find the one that we like, I'll get it all polished up. And I'm not worried about the polish right now because probably only one or two of these are going to be what we're looking for. But now it's going to be, we're going to do the first, day one, we're going to gather data. Now we're just going to be out there freezing for a whole day this is probably going to be very time consuming and I'll show you how I make my notebook up but then the hard part is making the compromises that we're going to have to make because once we do this once we get to the point where this is final it's final I want to do this once I want to take my time doing it and no matter how difficult it is I want to know that that's the muffle that's going to go in a plane because other people are going to be building 90 ships and if I can pass this information on to them, they're going to be one step ahead. Or if Rich or anybody tools up to make these commercially, well, we want to have them that we know that they're not going to be junk or they're not going to be in some way inferior to what we're able to do with the technology we already have. Now, we've already got this one, except for the fact being ugly. This one's certainly acceptable. And if I were to send this out to Scott Dinger, he would make a nice, well, I'd get a new header. He'd do a nice welding job. This is a windy job. This got us through a test period. But when I want a professional job, this is a Scott, a Scott Dinger job. Looks a lot more like a fuel dragster would look. A lot prettier. And the simple reason, he's a professional welder. I mean, these welds are not going to break, and they're going to polish up like jewelry when I go to polish them. The same way, this carbon pipe, it probably looks pretty good, but I don't know about the reliability. I don't know how long it's going to last. But certainly, I want to keep track of everything. And, and again, I'm trying to do all this once, so I'll have a database that all winter, when there's snow on the ground, and somebody says, 
can we do this or that or how did this work or that? Well, we'll have some information to work with because gathering data. Now, you remember last year I had all the data from the Testarossa. Every gram weight, every, every part of that plane is weighed out. Now I can kind of go along with it, but I know I have a three ounce handicap. But one of the things I'm not going to need is a tuned pipe. So I can save two, two and a half ounces, maybe less than two, depending on what pipe I'm using. I can save the, the weight of the rubber coupler, but I've got to get this right. I just can't go snapping one of these on and hoping for the best. Now this is part of the, the data that we're going to gather. We're going to, and I've just written it down as, for my own reference, square one, we've always tried to run this engine around 8400, give or take 100 RPM. And I want to record the, te the temperature at 8400, and I'll probably record the head temperature and the exhaust temperature both. And I want to get the temperature at maximum RPM. That's when it's really, when it's really cooking. I want to have that when it's at maximum. We're going to do this all on a test bench, and we're going to do it very methodically. I want to know the weight of the total exhaust system, because the weight is going to factor into this. If I have two or three ounce or four ounce exhaust system, it could be a deal breaker. And I want to know not the decibel reading, the sound character. Does it have a, a pleasant sound or does it have a sound of, uh, I don't know how we should even uh, define it, a sound of a weed whacker. Loss or gain in RPM, when we find the 2-4 break point, at, at our square one exhaust breaks at about 8400, if all of a sudden it starts breaking at 8600, we know we have a gain. If it breaks at 8300, we know we have a loss. If it's the same, it's a tie. And then I want, and this is the only part of it that isn't really important to me, is the, mat. now if we were speed flyers, this would be the number one thing on a chart. Maximum sustained RPM. Can we bring it to 9,000, to 8,800? What, what's our maximum? Because what that's going to tell us is, let's just say, if this exhaust system has the biggest power gain, well then we know we can possibly restrict it even a little more just like Brian Ether putting those screws in the, in the exhaust. Or we can make, in this case, some little restrictors for these or something. But anyway, we're going to start. And the first thing I'm going to do is weigh all. I'm going to number each one and weigh each one and see what they weigh. So that gets us started down the road to gathering data. And this I'll do tonight but and tomorrow, I'm hoping. I'm hoping, first of all, it's not going to be anywhere as near as cold as today. It would be best to do this in 70 degree temperature if possible, but I think we're going to settle for 55 or 60. Now maybe that I'm jumping a gun here a little bit, but the first thing I want to do, I want to get all my numbers from the square one exhaust. And I just thought I'd put this tip on for all the people that may or may not someday be using 90s. These screws, if you mill a header down, which some of these headers are milled and some of them are going to have to be dremeled out, so in essence to make adapters out of them, one of the things you want to be really careful of is these screws, if you mill ahead, you mill the flange, and then don't shorten the screws, you can run the screw length right into the barrel of the engine and of course damage it. So Rich told me, be real careful, in fact I'm, I'm going to make some shorter screws so that I have all this hardware ready for our test day. The stock screws work good on a stock header. We're going to have to dremel some of these out and, of course, keep track of it. Now, one of the things that worked for us, and it wasn't a problem at all, we, we thought it might be, was to get rid of that block. And that does two things. That, that totally allows you to get the tank this thickness closer to the engine without interference. And also, it, it weighs 14 grams, 13 or 14 grams. It's a half an ounce. So it just allows you to get a little bit a little bit of a head start on this three ounce weight gain that we have to make up for. It's like losing weight. It's a good way to diet. Now this seemed to seal really well. We didn't have any oil. There's almost no oil. A couple little dots of oil on the head of it. Seemed to make a really good seal. So we're going to seal all of them before we actually even start the test. And this is our number one. This is where we're going to start all the data from. So here's what will be from this point in time on our number one exhaust system is 52 grams. So we're going to start with, and of course if we can improve it, 
or but we will allow that 52 grams is just a little bit under two ounces this one falls within the realm of reasonability and I'm going to take the Dremel tool and just etch on it number one so now this one test weight test number one and this is just for my reference 52 test number one and this is the one where we know we have good run character with this and we know the sound is acceptable and the things we can you know hopefully make better maybe at this we for sure can make the lack of a weld at the back of this sloppy look better I don't know if we're going to be able to get away with one of these or two but again at 8400 we may not need the second opening we only needed this when we were running the motor at a higher RPM but again this is how we're going to try hopefully in the next week or so gather some data so we know this is the information we can put into the database and I'll just do this for one and do the rest of them off camera our number one standard we know it's 52 we know we've gutted out the flange gotten rid of all the extra material and what that tells me is I'm probably not going to be able to get this much under 50 even with a lot more Dremel tooling I'm kinda of locked into the fact I'm around 50 G's here or 51 or 52 but I'm going to go right down with each one of the systems we're going to test and I'll have all of this data started before we ever even start an engine so the only thing left to do tonight is grind the holes so that these the 76 ones fit on the 90 get a set of short screws I think tomorrow we're going to be ready to go on this this is getting everything prepped up for a test like this it's a big plus when you get all the parts ready we will have them ready lined up like little soldiers and get the motor in a test bench as soon as we get some weather outside that and the warmer it'll be the better for our test there's a lot of handiwork in there and again thanks again to Scott Dinger for adding his little piece to the puzzle and when we get a final design we're gonna know more after a full day of testing now every day we of course start the day most of the time we do it off camera but loading up our molds for the day but we got some good news on the the spinner back plates I hope are gonna be coming real soon and we have had this molded from Dave Midgley that has just been popping parts out every day so all we're waiting for now is back plates and we will have I mean the, the crux I hope of some really nice spinners these really look like they're going to be nice when they're done now the other thing Rich Oliver is going to send me the equivalent of this which goes on a 76 but with the 90 back plate and I'm going to make an adapter up so I can run one of these with the adapter built right in on a 90 that's going to be one of our next steps a part of the organization of getting all these benches refinished and getting everything organized here really makes my work day the part of the day you don't see on a video just go as smooth as glass here having everything in drawers this worked out so good all the little parts for the tune pipes and all the little things for the tanks and all the little molds and it's just, just so nice working with things when you've got them organized anyway we're gonna hopefully it's gonna warm up later today we're gonna do that test for the mufflers but it's it's pretty brutal out there right now and I spent quite a bit of time yesterday getting this stuff organized and we're ready to do the test but I figured well it's it's early it's still early in the morning here and it is cold and I wanted it to be I was hoping it would be 70 degrees before I do that test but looks like it's gonna be more like 55 or 60 but we'll just take that into account Now this is from Rich Oliver, and this is what he's done to mount Brodak wheel pants onto a, uh, a carbon fiber gear. He sent some photos showing how he's done it. It's a little bit different than we normally do it. This I think is the way they do it in RC, but let's check this out. Now what's nice about this is you don't see the edge coming down on the wheel pant. It looks like all the screws are internal. Kind of a nice way to do it, in fact. Yeah, that looks like a real nice, nice, neat way to do it. 
kind of like that. Now he's showing some of the hex of how he did this. He made a little cover at a hex stock, turned down the screw hole. Pretty nice. This is the kind of thing I hope he'll write up for Control Line World. Get a uh, this would be a good article, Rich. Got to tell you, this would be good in Control Line World. That's a nice way to do it. Now, apparently, this is the way a lot of the big RC planes do it. So, any anything you can add to our choice of ideas, work for me. And of course, those are the carbon fiber gear that we make. Now, it could be that. Uh, Maybe one of the things we could consider in the future is making a little kit of all these parts. That'd be worth doing. Anyway, I think this is a great little idea. This view shows a little bit better how this goes together. Anyway, now that we have a lathe, hey, we can even make something like this. And we'll obviously see this when we're down in, uh, in Texas. Well, Rich, I appreciate it, and thanks for sending us a great idea. We're going to try to get out there as soon as it warms up a little bit and get those muffler tests started. It's going to be a long, intensive day, but again, any little idea we can have to make things a little nicer, easier, quicker, better, it all works for me. And we always stock these wheel pants, and of course we always have the gear in stock. And as we speak, even yet one more pair is going into molds. There's an unending supply of those go out into the world of control line. That picture today from, from Rich Walbridge, who I think they gave him the boot he's moving up to advance this year. Well, Rich, hey, as well as your uh, landing gear solution, congratulations. And I look forward to seeing you get this cardinal done. He's been getting some one-on-one -on -one tutoring from Phil Grandison, and boy, that sure can't hurt. And, hey, good luck with the new plane and with the one that Phil has loaned you uh, to move up the ranks. Anyway, and we hope, most of all, you're enjoying some of the uh, interaction with us here on the East Coast. Now, as as always, Phil Grandison's planes have exceptional paintwork, and this looks this looks pretty cool. It's called a switchback. Well, it's warmed up to 56 degrees, and so we're going to get ready and make sure all the bolts are tight. We get ready to start our muffler test, and of course, we'll start with exactly what's been in the plane for the whole time we've been flying a plane, and get our first preliminary readings. I got the table set up outside. We're ready to wait every time you flip this over. Ooh. The air density is real good today. We'll be making more than average, way more than average power, I'm sure. We got our laser laser thermometer, our tack, all the instruments we're gonna need to to do this test. And you think boy is it? That wind is howling out here, wow. Now one of the things we're gonna try to do, and by the way, listen to those wind chimes blowing around. We're using all the things that we would normally use in a plane. The same fuel, same glow plug, same prop, same spinner, same exhaust. All of the readings we're getting right here on the first run, this is our square one run from which we'll compare everything else. And we know this was a pretty good square one. So to try to up the bar here may be difficult, may be impossible, but at least we'll know at the end of this day.
Okay, got the data for one, one down and eight to go. This is gonna be a long day, I can tell. But this gives us all our square one information. And now I'm just gonna go through these one by one. The next part of the test will be the short header. Again, this is a 76 flange. This is not this is not a a 91 header. And one of the things we want to try to figure out from this test is are we going to need the bigger header or is the 70 the 76 header going to flow the same amount and run the same temperature? Now there's a little bit of interesting information that I wasn't sure, and I'm still not sure how to uh, how to interpret it correctly. But we certainly will log that in. Now this is a 76 header. It's shorter, and we must be getting some kind of a spike because with the exact same needle setting, I'm up almost 300 RPM. I was almost up to 89 there. Now it's. It's varying because of the cold weather. Of course, it's varying from 85 to 86, where I'm finding that 2.4 break is up a couple hundred RPM, I think, because of the cold weather being a number one factor and that high air density. But what's really, really interesting here is this is the smaller diameter header and half of the amount of volume, and yet we've got an RPM increase. So. Now there's just something that's interesting because now just think if nothing else, this header is is three quarters of an ounce lighter than the uh, the heavier one. So now it's now it's going to get to be an interesting test. And the temperature we were getting 170, 172 with the original header. This has dropped it down. It was a little bit lower in the high 160s. Now it's really interesting to me because. Like I said in the very beginning, there's always some rules where you think there's a, a steadfast rule, and yet the rule has an exception. And now, if you had asked me right off the get-go, the smaller header was going to be more restrictive and run hotter, I'd say, well, that's... Now, see, the reason we're getting away with this, or getting away with it is not the right word. The reason this is happening to a certain degree is because we're running the motor at a lower RPM than, than let's say the RC people are. You can bet they're running it at a much higher RPM. So, at a much higher prop load, we're actually, the motor isn't really working that hard, but here we are. This is number three, and this is one that's given us, it's, it's a smaller header. The smaller, you can see where I've got the face modified, so I can, I actually, when I'm gonna put it permanently, I'll put washers on this. But it's not the lightest one. We have one that's 10 grams lighter than this even. But again, ran fine. So for all the time we did the testing, we could have had the shorter header on. And the sound for all purposes is exactly the same. And the next header, it's a 76 header with the flange, the normal flange. And it's only got one 425 stinger. So now the interesting thing is gonna be, not only how many RPM do we lose from the needle set where the 24 is, and again, we use an 8485 as the baseline, but this should be, in essence, quieter. That's not always true, because sometimes the sound gets annoying. But boy, is this getting to be an interesting, the kind of day that, it, see, this is the thing. Doing this stuff is very, very time consuming. Relatively speaking, most people don't want to spend this time. They want to just get out to the flying field, and I can't hate them for that.
And the course of doing the test, we're probably going to use up the better part of a gallon of fuel because all this back and forth. Luckily, we have a big tank. But but is this information going to serve us well in the future? You bet. Probably even going to serve you well. Now that's exactly what we expected, more restriction. It's a just a slight bit quieter, but not much. I had to go in a quarter of a turn on the needle to get the break point back, which is telling me it's not flowing anywhere as near as well as the one with more uh, wider opening anyway. Now, the data that I can take, that I can deduce from this is, the single stinger one is too small and possibly the double stinger one might be on the big side but you see right in this area here is the critical area we're over 200 degrees now we were 170 160 with the more open one so you see what happens as soon as you restrict this you put a restriction here first thing happens is it starts backing up the temperature into the engine and so right away we've learned something well we've learned more than more than just a few things as we're going through this test and Time to replace the exhaust and just move on, record the data, and go to the next one. This is the first one that I've had to alter the needle valve setting to get back my 84, 8500. Now this is where it will probably get a lot more interesting. Here we have a big header. This is a 70, a 90 header with the face relieved, two openings. So before I even start this, I'm going to back out the needle a quarter of a turn. I don't want to get it running lean. And now the thing that we'll find out is if we're going to get any kind of a spike, and again, what I'm looking for is a length that's going to give me some kind of a spike. If I have it, if I don't, it's not a problem. But I want to know where that spike is, if I'm going to have to deal with it. And what will be interesting, then when we get whatever's going to win the muffler fly-off here today, of course the real test is to try them in a plane. But what I'm going to do is try to line them up in, in order of desirability and then see if, as I'm flying them, if they're just as desirable. In other words, does the test reflect the reality? Now, if we had flying weather, of course, we're not in Houston. We're not spoiled by the good Houston air where you fly every day in complete comfort and luxury, like Rich Oliver, where your whole life is basically a soft couch Now, we're going to find out if this is going to be any kind of an advantage having a shorter because everything else is the same. The header, there's no restriction at the header. So the two things I'm looking for is to get the temperature back down, get the restriction back down, and get my needle valve setting back where it was when it was in the plane. I was hoping it would really warm up a bit, but I guess we're going to have to live with it.
Now this one is a little more restrictive. I had to go in on the needle to get back to break point. You, you heard that it, it's struggling to get up on its break point. And the temperature is higher than with the first two. So we started to narrow down the ones that aren't giving us exactly what we want. And we'll put this one at the end of the line right now. Now it's funny how little things pop up and those little exceptions to the rule jump up at you. It's, it's just totally amazing. Now next is our longest header, 76 full length header with the twin exhaust. Now it was amazing because when we tested the, the shorter one, we got an, an RPM spike and it ran cooler and I was impressed. So now the test will be, do we want the longer of the 76 or the shorter? And what we're doing, just going through one right after another. It just takes time. And boy, we're not sure not losing a flying day. You hear those wind chimes? Unbelievable. What a crappy day and we're supposed to have three or four more days of this. Even more interesting, we're about 20 degrees cooler on the header, in on a needle, and it sounds like the 2-4 brake is right about where it should be, about 84, 8500. So that's that's definitely one of the usable ones. One, in other words, that's going to make its way into the fly-off. So I've eliminated two already as being either too restrictive that one with one stinger, that was just a little too restrictive. Now maybe that'd be fine if we had a smaller plane or a lighter plane, but for right now that's going to be uh, at the tail end here. And if you could tell ahead of time what the, if you were doing this at NASA or something and you had flow benches and things, it'd be a lot easier, but just doing it seated to pants wise like this, this, this certainly gets you through. And for sure, the one thing we've come away from this for sure knowing is you really don't need to have the 91, the 90 header. The 76 header, when we make either an adapter or we put washers on this or some other way of confining it, I think is gonna, it's going to save weight and it's going to also, in a lot of ways, make the plane easier to build because the tank will be less likely to bump into it in the back when we try to fit a tank in. You'll buy something, assuming the motor run doesn't change, and assuming what I was assuming was going to happen is this was going to spike the temperature. No way. Okay, the next one is going to be the one we made from, it's a, a machined flange header, 76 header, and Brian's little muffler, which we know this runs good in the air. It should give us an idea now, and, and it'll, the temperature will be the interesting thing to pick up off of this one. And it'll be interesting to see if we're gaining anything with all that volume back there and all that length. Because we know this one runs good in a plane.
pretty interesting. The restriction in this muffler is in the muffler. It's hotter at the muffler than it is back here. So it's telling me something that if if you restrict it back here, the temperature starts to build up back here. And that's one of the reasons. Up here it was it was 20 degrees cooler. Back here it got real hot. So the restriction is back here. So we'll now we know this one ran good in the plane. Also, another indication of a lot of restriction is when you have to go in on a needle. In the best of all worlds, you want to go out on a needle. It's telling you you're flowing more air. So I'm going to put this needle back before we run the next test. So Brian's actually, even though we had this in the plane, now I'm very disappointed. Here's some of the highs and lows. I thought this was going to be, and this is, this is really heavy too. This is a lot heavier than... Uh, and we'd have to run this in a plane to see, because this, this is the one that Zambelli machined the flange to almost nothing. And I was afraid we may have gone too far on that flange machining. But so far, we've had a couple little surprises pop up at us, and this is one of them. And I really, really thought, when I got to this part of the test, I thought, well, the thing I've learned that, that's significant is, it's always been that the hottest part of any muffler is right here at the engine, but when you restrict, oh, you can't even touch that. When you restrict it in the back, what happens, it starts building up heat back here. Now, I'll bet if you ran this for a long enough time, this, the heat, of course, it traveled back down. Also, what, what hurts is when you have a rubber coupler, the rubber coupler doesn't pull any of the heat out of the engine. It kind of confines it, so anyway. This is our first, this is the first real disappointment of the day, and it's a disappointment because we've had it in a plane and I know it's it seemed well, see what was what was different is in the beginning of this test, we really had a lot of stuff. It, it might not be anywhere as near as good as what we have now. We never really could evaluate it. It's like having your first girlfriend and, and you know, somewhere down the road, you realize she wasn't just as good as you thought she was. And probably she didn't think you were as good as you were either. So anyway, the first one that goes, um, this goes at the end of the line. Now we've never had Sergi's muffler actually with the big stinger in the plane, but we know it was very restrictive. Now this will be interesting to see how hot this muffler gets. And I notice, now this is the first time I've ever seen anybody make a muffler with fins on the back. I wonder if he did a heat test, if he did what we're doing, he found out the back of the muffler was, was just heating up from restriction because this was restricting the, the, uh, the engine run. Well, we're gonna find out. Now what I used to run into years ago, and I'm, maybe you did too, is I'd be trying to learn something. When I was trying to learn about molding and different epoxies and different things, and I'd call people up and they'd give me, oh, I know all about that. Oh, I'll do this, do this, do this, do that. Now obviously some of the people did, and they did it with good intention. They passed on, like Wayne Triven, for instance, good information, good, solid, reliable information. Now, Dubjet, another one, good, solid, reliable information. But other people, I mean, the word bullshit has given them the benefit of a doubt. And I'd find out later on, they never even did the test, or they never even tried that prop, or that glow plug, or that construction technique, or whatever. But they were always given advice. Now, because of the internet, we have a, that's, that's a, a pretty common thing to be, uh, an internet guru, but what what I'm saying is when you have an internet guru and he doesn't have any video showing you him doing a test, I'd be thinking, hmm, maybe and maybe not. I don't know. Now, this will be interesting too. i got to put some fuel in there. And the other thing I try to figure out is, is when I'm doing this kind of testing, if I were to do this test and then keep everything a secret, well, I'm not sure it would be time well spent, but I always feel like anything I learn, the fact that I can learn it and pass it on to a lot of people, it may justify me freezing out here all day and going through, probably before the day's out, a gallon of fuel. Plus, we've done a whole lot of this test off camera. We haven't done, we certainly haven't done the whole thing on camera. You think, you think you'd be bored. You would be. This, this gets boring after a while.
Yeah, very interesting. Cool as a cucumber up on the header, even with the machine flange. 180, 180 for the whole exhaust system. The only problem with this now, with the big stinger, for some reason, and I, there's no way to measure this, this doesn't have the same sound. This has a, I don't know, in real life, a, uh, a louder sound. It sounds like it may be echoing in the chamber rather than suppressing the sound. I don't know. But I, I have no way of measuring it other than ask 10 people to listen to it. But, but for sure, this is running cool. Now, what happened too is, and notice this is the thing that always matters. When you have to go in on a needle, it always tells you it's somehow restricting. But keep in mind, this is a machined header, so we don't have those those nice, uh, when you have the big thick flange, you, there's a little bit of a flow entry into it. This is kind of a step. Now just some of the things I thought about doing, I had eliminated the idea today that I was gonna try to run these at maximum RPM. I just thought for right now, I can just eliminate the bad ones right off the bat. And I don't really need to know, for instance, if this one ran 100 RPM more than another one, it's kind of, I'm not looking for an RPM spike. I'm looking for that character, that right around 84, 8500, where it breaks nice and free and clean. And I'm looking for that nice, uh, I don't know, traditional sound. This will be our next one. This is the one I was, I never had this in a plane yet. Did not have the opportunity to fly this. But what I'm coming away from this with very, very conveniently too is at least two or three really good choices. And at least two or three of these guys that are that have been eliminated. Now this one I have to open up the header just a little bit more. In fact, for right now I can just leave the washer off. And I think that'll solve the problem. Since all I want to do is just run a, a one minute test here. And I wasn't sure the way I'm going to know if these flanges being machined are an issue or not is by flying a plane for X amount of fuel and just seeing if... Listen to that wind, wow. I'm going to have to grind away on this header a little bit more. The reason I'm not paranoid about it now is we're not going to it doesn't look like we're going to go flying for a few days. We have just had, we have just had crappy weather. And of course, every day Mr. Oliver calls and to, to tell me how wonderful it is in Houston. In this one, I'm going to leave the motor run until we run out of gas because I want to see what the temperature is back here. And I want to see if the temperature here, if it melts or if it deteriorates at all. And I can get, I can get the same reading, of course. And we know the worst one went over 200. The best one is down around 170. So we know there's a 30 degree range just within these mufflers that we have. Now, it probably would totally change on a hotter day, a warmer day, put it in a cowling, but we have some there's some real readings as to which one of these exhausts are backing up gases into the engine and which are letting it just flow out.
I'm just going to let it run out and see that material deteriorate. Now talk about some eye-opening numbers. I wanted to capture the number. This, this section is running over 350 degrees. At the very end of the test it was 340, 350. Now that resin is only rated to 350 on, in some cases. So, and it's running a hundred, almost a hundred degrees hotter than the header. So this is not happening. This, this is, on a hot day in Houston, that isn't happening. So we have really narrowed this down to two choices. And I'm going to take both of them and rerun the test on both of them just to confirm my suspicions. And then from the two, in other words, what I'm going to do is have kind of a fly-off of the best two to convince myself which one is going to be the one that goes back in a plane or that we build a plane around or that we replicate. Because sometimes you do a test once and you get kind of a not a fake, but a. Uh, it's worth doing the test now on the best two. We've eliminated all of the ones that for one reason or another are, have some negative heat or some, some flow issues. And, and certainly this one has a, uh, well, it's a quiet sound, but it's not a sound that, that's really attractive to me anyway. I like the, I like the more, uh, I don't know, the more, tr this has a muted sound. The other one has a growl. But I'm glad we I'm glad we're learning all this on days when there's a hurricane going through here. And what a day this has been. And we've we've kind of in our database made notes of which is the best, the worst, the hottest, the coolest. And not all of it followed the the exact rule of thumb that we were thinking of. But we did do the test. We're gonna do the back end of this test again and run off the two best ones and then make a decision. And that'll be the one we, we polish up and put back in a plane. And sometimes you just have to spend the time, use the fuel, and just, just do it. Well, I'm confident that the time was well spent. One of the things what, that looks like it's going to be very practical is getting rid of some of the material off the, the flange on the 76 headers. It's not going to be possible on the 90s because they've, they've taken too much material here unless we put washers under the bolts and I guess you could do that. But that, that may not be the most practical thing in the world. But boy, we sure figured this out. And... Yeah, now, to really do the next part of the test, and this was, I thought, the best overall run character and the lowest temperature and the best flow came from this header. But, but there's really one more part of this. We've got to put it in a plane. Once it's in a plane for 
and of course we need some weather which doesn't look like it's happening in the next couple days but what we really need is a cup of Gervalia and a flying day now to confirm our what we're uh, well what we're trying to establish here is what's going to be the best muffler for this engine now the only thing I guess what I should do is get the plane all assembled up and put it back where it was just so if we do get some weather we can run out and confirm our suspicions on this muffler test but this was a pretty intensive day and I'm sure we've learned something something we can put in the bank and again I want to thank Scott Dinger for a great job boy the welds on these are beautiful Uh, things like you look at it, it's almost like a piece of sculpture anyway we don't need sculpture we need a flying day for some testing so I hope you learned something I hope I learned something from this uh, and we really did what was a pretty exhaustive day but I think uh, we have more data in that database now than we had yesterday Now it looks like our hurricane winds have died down to a, well, I wouldn't say this is going to be a stunt pattern day, but we're going to be able to do some engine testing anyway. And all the testing in the world on a bench isn't worth if it doesn't translate into some good flights. And so I'm starting with what I thought was the number one setup from our muffler test. And I'm going to try to go through the top three mufflers, the ones that I thought had some real potential. And I'm just waiting here. We have somebody in the parking lot working on their car, so I don't want to start until they, they actually leave. Because we do have some people that don't speak English, and they just walk right out here. Now, the conditions today are, it's really cold. It's in the low 50s. we got probably uh, 97 on the air density meter. A train going through the parking lot. That's what we need. But I think the air is good enough that I can get some feedback on how these three mufflers are going to run and which of the three I like the best. We've kind of eliminated four or five of them right out of the mix for one reason or another. Hot temperatures. Or that they will, we will lose an RPM or something. But we've slowly but surely zeroed in on what I hope is going to be some data that we can use. Of course, first start of the day, this is going to be a ball. This is going to really be fun. And the only thing that seems to ever work on its cold weather is the old lighter fluid trick. Now, I got to constantly watch out here because we had somebody here this morning doing one of their learning how to drive. Oh, in fact, they're back. Oh, man. I don't believe this. Some days, you just can't win. Anyway, this was the muffler that, from that, that test, seemed to be the winning muffler. I'm going to open this up a little bit, just to start. And we'll deal with the first startup of the day here. Once it starts, it's okay, but boy, this first one, look at these people, unbelievable. And then I also have Doran's, the prop, Doran is, in the last couple days, two things have changed. Doran's agreed to send me the mold to make props, so I'll be able to video that. Make some four-blade props, and Rich Oliver got his ticket to come to the Build-A-Thon, so a lot of interesting stuff in the next couple weeks. Oh, come on, it's too cold for that. Too cold. There we go, it's flooded. 